let's turn then to talking about doctrinal developments. As we've already kind of hinted at with the uh, Enlightenment, and as we've pointed to in, in previous lectures, the development of science was, uh, it was leading to discoveries that people were beginning to say, we don't need the church to help us understand this. Right? And so this, this split developing between science and religion. The development of natural theology was an attempt to try and address this split between science and religion, arguing that the natural world indicated the existence of God. Now, natural theology, in a sense, had been around for centuries. Uh, and there was even evidence of this approach back in Greek philosophy, um, certainly not Christian uh, in, its, in its Greek form. But essentially the idea that, that God's existence could be determined from nature and not just revelation. Essentially there was the idea that God had two books. There was the book of Revelation, the Bible, and the book of nature. One of the first major natural theologians in the 18th century, perhaps the one that makes the most impact, was William Paley. Uh, Paley was born in England in 1743 and would eventually become a lecturer at Christ's College at Cambridge. And a lot of his focus was on lecturing on moral philosophy, people like Locke and some of the others from previous generations. He's ordained an Anglican priest in 1767 and would go on to write a variety of textbooks mostly on philosophy. But he would write several ap uh, apologetic works on Christian evidences. There are a couple of areas where Paley's important. First is his presentation of what is known as the teleological argument, or the argument from design. Paley compares life to a watch found in the forest. Coming upon such an object, we would assume that there was a watchmaker, a creator behind it. Now, there has been a similar argument for the existence of God around for a long time. We've seen it as back as far as scholasticism. But Paley's is the one that catches, along, catches on with a lot of Anglo-Protestants, especially in the United States. Paley's also important because he develops a couple of arguments that are meant to be evidences of the truthfulness of Christianity based on a couple of things, two major ones, the suffering of the apostles and early Christians. Why would they be willing to suffer and be persecuted for something they did not believe to be true? And then secondly, arguing that the miracles of the New Testament were much more trustworthy than other ancient miracle stories in other religions because they were better attested. Certainly, several of these arguments and others were very useful for Christians, helped strengthen their faith. But they certainly didn't persuade many people who were and are antagonistic to traditional Christianity. Also important uh, doctrinally in the 18th century is the writing and thinking of Jonathan Edwards. He has been referred to as America's greatest theologian. Part of that has to do with just the amount of how much material has been left by Edwards. Uh, Yale University has put out the works of Jonathan Edwards. It's 26 volumes and consists of um, the, uh, well, the, essentially Edwards left 100,000 handwritten pages that have been now typeset and put into print, right? So for how prolific he was, certainly that. But also he has very important impact on especially Calvinist's forms <laughs> of American Christianity. He was born in 1703 in Connecticut to a minister and his wife. Um, and very on in his life, his father is preparing for Jonathan to be a minister as well. His father ran a school to prepare boys for college, and so Jonathan learned early in his life classical and biblical languages, philosophy, science, and church history. In 1716, he would enter what would eventually become Yale. It's not named Yale at the time that uh, he enters it, 
He would graduate as valedictorian of his class in 1720 and would begin graduate studies to become a minister. He becomes interested in the writings of Isaac Newton, John Locke, and other philosophers and scientists. While still a student, he begins preaching for a Presbyterian church in New York City. Most of his sermons uh, were, as some people have put it, warm, earnest, and optimistic, emphasizing the beauty of God and the godly love. Edwards finished his degree in 1723 and begins preaching in a variety of places over the next several years. He would work as a tutor for a while at Yale College, but eventually moves to Massachusetts to help his grandfather with ministerial duties. His grandfather would die in 1729, leaving Jonathan Edwards the sole minister. He is very concerned that a lot of New England theology is becoming Arminian. Right? The notion that, that there isn't predestination uh, of individuals. The notion that, um, you know, that, that people uh, have some freedom in choosing with their salvation. And so he focused a lot on his preaching on what God's grace does to a person's soul, emphasizing the importance of God's work rather than human work. In the mid-1730s, his congregation begins experiencing a great revival. There's lots of emotionalism, lots of people committing to Christianity, joining the church as members, and he publishes a work called A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God about what's going on. The work does very well, becomes, makes Edwards well-known, even known internationally as the book is sold overseas overseas, and people look to him as a model of evangelism. Right? This is working, so let's look, do what Edwards has done. However, by the late 1730s, he starts to experience tensions with the church he is ministering to. They, the church had built a new building and gave preferred seating to the wealthy people in the town. And Edwards doesn't like this practice, and he makes it known. Uh, furthermore, people that had converted in the mid-1730s didn't seem to be evidencing godly behavior or even that in-depth, constant concern for religion. And so he becomes convinced that those conversions in the middle of the 1730s were false. But he would continue to try and uh, bring back the revival. In the 1740s, he would see it again. Edwards would try to fit, uh, feed off of this fervor and in the midst of it preaches his most famous ser sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, in which he talked about um, the flames of the wrath of God, uh, that, um, that essentially human beings have nothing to stand on, we are going to fall into the pit. Uh, God despises sinners, he holds them over the pit of hell, much like one would hold a spider or some loathsome, lonesome, uh, loathsome insect. A very terrible description of how the sinner stands before God. And Edwards Church doesn't really respond that much to the sermon, but when he preaches it in a nearby town, the people moan and shriek and weep, crying out for their salvation for fears of going to hell. This in the face of the fact that Edwards himself, as a minister, was evidently very monotone. There wasn't very much emotionalism in his presentation either. And so it's just from the words themselves that are causing this reaction. Edwards continues to write and preach in support of the revivals, but there is growing opposition because of the emotionalism. So in 1746, he writes a treatise concerning religious affection. Religion, says Edwards, consists in holy affections or emotions. But there was the need for individuals to make a distinction between what constituted true religious emotions and were not religious emotions. Just because you felt like it was love or there was an effect on your body didn't mean that it was a true religious affection. True affections resulted in a change of nature. True, uh, true affections had a result in Christian practice, you could see that somebody had been changed. Edwards' rep reputation also con continues to spread internationally. He tries to keep up with international developments and news and works them into his sermons. 
but tensions continue with his congregation. He preaches against immorality among the people, condemns some, condemns some things that are going on in the town. Ultimately, the church demands that Edwards give an account of how he is spending the funds he receives from the church as a salary. He was dismissed. He was fired. In 1750. In his last sermon, he preaches about the day of judgment and how both minister and congregation will have to appear before Christ and give an account of what had happened there in Northampton, Massachusetts. With Edwards claiming he is going to be vindicated. And wouldn't you like to preach that as your, as your, your last sermon in the church? You're going to have to stand before God for what you've done to me. Um, he would uh, end up preaching for a small congregation, evangelizing Native Americans, Eventually, he was asked to become president of the College of New Jersey, which would eventually become Princeton. As he arrived there, there's a smallpox outbreak. Uh, Edwards took the smallpox inoculation, but it was infected, and he died in 1758 after several weeks of illness. His impact, however, uh, probably can't be um, overstated not only among Calvinists, Calvinist theologians, uh, even up till today. I mean, very prominent um, preacher Rick Warren names uh, Edwards as his favorite theologian. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was this revival of interest in Reformed theology and a picture on Christianity Today, uh, the t-shirt with Jonathan Edwards on that said, Jonathan Edwards is my homeboy. All right, so he's had a much broader effect on uh, American Christianity. Let's turn to uh, a couple of ways of, of changes in development of Christian practice. First, I want to talk about the development of Methodism. Methodism was started by John and his brother Charles Wesley. Uh, they were raised in a religious family of 19 kids. Only 11 of those survived. Uh, Charles was four years younger than John. Uh, they would almost died in the fire when John was six. Samuel and Susanna Wesley, the, mother, the father and mother, uh, were very, very angry and very focused on the church. <coughs> Um, but both of their fathers, both Samuel's father and Susanna's father, had been kicked out of the Anglican ministry. They raised their children uh, in the church. Um, Samuel was a priest, uh, but he was also a poet. John would go, to uh, would go uh, on to study at Oxford, uh, along with Charles, and they participated in a group that met uh, to focus on study and worship. They practiced weekly communion. They encouraged each other to visit people in prison. They spent a lot of time together fellowshipping. The group was pejoratively called the Holy Club uh, or Methodists because they had this method that they were following. It included a member named George Whitfield. We'll come back to Whitfield. John would eventually become an Anglican priest. He is traveling to um, the American colonies uh, on a mission uh, trip, and while on the trip, a storm comes up, and Wesley is terrified of what's going to happen with the storm, and he happens to look over and see a group of Moravians who were Christians from Eastern Europe, um, pietists, people that were very focused on an emotional connection to God, and here they are in this storm, and they're not scared, they're not terrified, they're at peace, and, and uh, with uh, one of these guys, who are we talking about? John Wesley. Wesley becomes very concerned because he doesn't have that faith. Right? He doesn't have that conviction that no matter what happens, God is going to get me through, so I don't need to fear. And so he becomes very concerned about his salvation. While reading Luther's work on the Epistle to the Romans, he begins to feel, as he's put it, his heart strangely warmed. 
and becomes convinced that now he has achieved salvation. He would go to travel to Germany and meet uh, the leader of the Moravians, but would eventually come back to England, where he would study with um, other uh, Eng- he will study other English reformers. He becomes convinced that the Anglican Church needs to have reform, but Wesley will always stay within the Anglican Church. He never breaks away from Anglicanism. Eventually, he will become Arminian uh, in his theology, especially when it came to the issue of salvation. He still believes salvation was by grace through faith, but believed that it was open to everybody. And he also believed that human beings could lose their salvation. They could fall from grace. Wesley would, would start preaching about this revival uh, that he was experiencing, and he would gain followers. He would divide them into smaller groups. They would call societies and then divide them into smaller groups known as classes, encouraging them to meet weekly, to, to read, to study, to pray. He would travel frequently to encourage these Methodists. Um, some people estimate he traveled 200,000 miles during his ministry. However, in these Methodist classes, most of the leadership were from the lower classes and used preachers who were not ordained in the Church of England. And so a lot of the upper class Anglicans start to break away from Methodists. They don't want to follow what Wesley's teaching because they've got these lower class leaders. They are democratic regarding leadership. Essentially, Wesley saw this as a parallel structure to the Church of England, right? It's, it's, it's within the Church of England, but it's meant to encourage the faith of people. But breaks eventually happen, with it developing into a separate denomination toward the end of the 18th century into the 19th century. Wesley also emphasized the idea of Christian perfection. Human beings, he believed, could become sinless through a second blessing of the Holy Spirit. But the second blessing only occurred after salvation. So it wasn't possible for you to be sinless before salvation. When you received the first blessing of the Holy Spirit, you were saved, but the second blessing, said Wesley, could bring salvation. Later in his life, Wesley would condemn the American Revolution, uh, thinking that it was uh, usurping, revolting against a godly ordained leader. But when many of the Anglican priests left the colonies, and the Anglican leadership refused to send more, he would set up Methodist leaders in the United States to perform the sacraments. While John became known for his preaching, his sermons, his writing, Charles became known for his work with hymns. Charles was the author or translator of 4,000 hymns, many of which are still used very prominently. Hymns like A Charge to Keep I Have, and Can It Be That I Should Gain, Hark, The Herald Angels Sing, and Soldiers of Christ Arise. The brothers would die within three years of each other in the 1780s. And at that point, the church had over 70,000 members and was close to becoming an independent church. There's a couple other things I want to talk about with 18th century practice evangelicalism and then talk about some other famous hymn writers of the time. Uh, We don't have the time to get into that now, so we'll pick that up on Tuesday when we will also go into...